Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, and Roth Distributing. of Feast TV is a celebration of all things summer Americana, burgers and barbecue. We are going to be introducing you to artisan charcoal makers here in Missouri. We're gonna drive down to Crystal City and taste some burgers that have not changed since 1948. And we're also gonna to travel to Southern Illinois to meet a barbecue legend. So clearly I'm in my backyard and we are going to be doing some grilling in this episode. So the first thing obviously that I need to do is get my charcoal started. Now I am using a kettle grill and I'm going to be using a chimney starter. Now Rockwood, they make lump charcoal. <laughs> Clearly I'm a little bit dirty now from putting my hand inside, but that's because this is real charcoal that's made only from Missouri hardwoods. Although this barbecue grill has a propane starter, I'm going to be using the chimney because this is what Rockwood recommends for its particular product. So all you have to do is fill this up. This is a very environmentally friendly way to start your fire because you're not using any charcoal fluid. All you do is take a bunch of newspaper, wad it up, and shove it underneath. All right, so I've got my newspaper down here in the bottom. All I have to do is give it a light. And what happens is the heat that's generated from the burning of the paper, it comes up through this chimney and it very efficiently gets the fire started chemical free. This will take about 10, 15 minutes to allow the charcoal to get to that white hot ash character. So while this is doing its thing, let's head to Southern Missouri and meet the folks that make Rockwood charcoal. Charcoal is 100% natural, briquettes are not. Uh, if you're looking to cook with the cleanest fuel, if you're going to cook with the best ingredients, why not cook with the cleanest fuel as well? Growing up, uh, one of the only traditions my family ever had was we always barbecued it inside my dad was in town. Uh, we would always barbecue and it's something that uh, I grew up doing and I enjoyed. And uh, when we bought in the, the early 90s, uh, it's pretty popular now, but the big green egg, nobody had ever seen one of these things. And uh, it required good lump charcoal for it to operate properly. So finding that was a problem. And every time I'd find something I'd like, all of a sudden it would disappear, I couldn't get, get it. So after a while, we did find some that we liked and uh, got to be such a large quantity that uh, was like, well, why don't, we, uh, why don't we make our own brand going to this for ourselves? The Wood you see behind me, it comes from sawmills, from the logging industry. It comes within a 50 mile radius of our location. It's basically the leftover from the logs, from the forest, from where they've cut the lumber out of. We're gonna take this, put it in our kilns, and start making Harvard lump charcoal from it. We put in roughly about 150 45 to 150 rank of wood at one shot, or about 75 cord, about 120 green tons. We put the sides in first. We'll have to set these bundles in here. And we'll set, well, I think we put five bundles per side on the bottom layer, and then we hand level those so they're flat. We primarily only try to use hardwoods, preferably oak and hickory. You'll get some cherry in there, and, but mainly anything classified as a hardwood in the state of Missouri except walnut, we will not buy walnut. But you want hardwood, one reason 
is for the flavor it gives off, of course, and it's, uh, it yields a better heartwood, so it's a tighter grain than softwood, so it'll burn hotter. The heat you're filling off the doors is in the process of making the wood to lump charcoal, and the outer exterior of the doors will get about 1,000 degrees. For the walls, they're actually a foot thick concrete, will get up to about 300 degrees exterior surface. The interior temperatures have been known to reach probably between 1500 and 2000 degrees. Lump charcoal is what you're seeing here, this raw wood burnt down to basically what's left as carbon. There's no additives, there's no fillers. Where a briquette, is basically they will use charcoal, they grind it up. So now how the process works, it depends on what brand you buy. Some of them use anthracite, which is a coal fly ash product from the coal mines. Some use sawdust, some use lime, and cornstarch for a binding agent. And then they mix that all into a big slurry batch, and then they push out in those nice little cube forms, form it, take it out, heat it up to recure, get it, remove all the moisture, and that's the end of a briquette. They're, they're, they're about as manufacturers as manufacturers can get. Where with all natural lump, a lot of people complain about the small sizes, the dust, the amount of fine particles. Problem is we have no control over the size of the lump charcoal because it's an all natural product. Basically, we get out of it whatever the wood brings back to us. So lump charcoal is something that a lot of people have never seen let alone used and it's I think it's very cool that it's being made right here in Missouri from Missouri hardwoods in a sustainable way uh, that's it's a really great story and it's a terrific product too um, so I'm gonna get to work on the components of the recipe which is by Shannon Weber who is our mystery shopper columnist she always develops amazing recipes for us and the mystery ingredient this month that she's focused on is pomegranate molasses now if you've never heard of this you can find it at international stores and it is essentially a pomegranate syrup and when you taste it by itself it tastes a little bit like a sweet tart. So it's a really fun ingredient that you find um, usually in kind of Middle Eastern recipes. So we're gonna be making a vinaigrette with this as well as a glaze for some chicken thighs. Now I'm gonna start off with the glaze first. It's kind of crazy simple. It's two ingredients. It's the pomegranate molasses and orange juice and that's it. So I'm just gonna mix the two together and call it a glaze. And then just the juice of one half of an orange. I mean, this really couldn't be easier, and the flavor is incredibly complex with that sweet, kind of acidic character of the pomegranate molasses, and then that kind of similarly sweet, uh, tart flavor of the orange. Delicious. Now I'm gonna make the vinaigrette for the salad. So again, the pomegranate molasses is a star in this vinaigrette, and I need one quarter cup. Now, some more citrus, which just is wonderful. Acid is something that a lot of people neglect adding to foods, but kind of like salt, it elevates all the other flavors. So if something tastes a little bit flat to you, if you add a little bit of acid, you're likely to really wake the flavors up in whatever it is that you're cooking. And now um, just a little bit of fresh ginger, which it's very easy to remove the skin of the ginger if you use the back of your spoon. All right, so we have two teaspoons roughly, you can eyeball this kind of stuff, of the fresh ginger. And now all we're going to do is add some salt and pepper and a half a cup of olive oil. In raw applications, like salads, use the good stuff, use your good olive oil. But if you're going to be heating the olive oil up, cooking or sauteing with it, just use something that's relatively inexpensive because it, you know, once you heat it up, that flavor um, kind of dissipates. So you know, don't waste your money when you're cooking with olive oil. So you might notice that I am only putting the oil in drop by drop, essentially, and that's because I want to create uh, an emulsion. And as you know, oil and vinegar don't like to uh, attach to one another. And so essentially when you're creating an emulsion, you, by stirring and whisking, 
um, while you're adding small bits of oil, you more evenly disperse the molecules. So it's more likely to remain kind of a, a bound solution as opposed to separating. Now this is finished. The vinaigrette is finished. So I am going to go ahead and move on and make the salad. Now, as I mentioned, um, we're going to be grilling some chicken uh, with that pomegranate glaze. And we're also going to be serving alongside it this big, gorgeous, summery salad. It's gonna start off with a bunch of just fresh arugula, which as you know, has that peppery bite to it. Just a few blackberries, some raspberries, I know everybody who is in the film crew is gonna be very excited to eat this particular salad because it is going to be delicious. Some pistachios, add some crunch. I'm gonna go ahead and hull these strawberries and slice them into quarters. And toss those right on top. For a little even more depth of flavor, this is just some chopped up mint and basil. Wonderful and then we're gonna put on just a little bit of goat cheese. This looks amazing and it smells like the essence of summer. Now I'm not gonna put the dressing on this because I don't know if you've noticed before, but when you dress a salad, it starts to wilt everything and my chicken has to go on the grill next. And so I'm going to go ahead and wait on the dressing. And uh, I want you to go down to Crystal City with me and meet the folks that are behind Gordon's Stoplight, which serves some of the best burgers that I've ever had. Gordon Stoplight. It was opened in uh, 1948 by Gordon Heddle. He was here and we bought it from him in May of 1997. And uh, we've been through 13 floods, recessions, depressions, everything in between, and we're, we're still here. We bought the store from the original owner, Gordon, on May the 12th, 1997. So this May the 12th will be our 17th year here. When we bought it from Gordon, he said he's tried everything over 50 years and this is what works and we believed him. Uh, we've added a chicken sandwich and bacon to our breakfast menu and other than that, everything is the exact same how he taught us. Everything is the same, the menu's the same, the process is the same, the recipes are the same and we're not gonna change a thing and it's been working since 1948. Every one of these burgers that are sold this morning were prepared this morning along with the chili and the slaw is prepared daily. We're not on a mass assembly line. We do everything old school method and it's not easy. That's not easy to do this when you've got 25 burgers on the grill and you must get them off in time, but they can do it and we have the people that can do it. We've got the best staff, the best crew, they're devoted. So many successful people have worked in this store. Our process is unique, I think. All of our hamburgers are made with 8119 pure ground beef. Uh, it's never frozen. We are gonna make a jumbo, a double jumbo, the quadzilla and a big burger. Smash everything flat to get a good crispy edge. They're never all the same. Them are pretty close to perfect there. Nice toasted bun. A single jumbo, single patty, raw chopped onions, slaw, and our own barbecue sauce. Coney Island, raw chopped onions, vinegar and oil, sweet and sour, slaw that we make in-house every day, and our house chili. A little messy sometimes. That is the Coney Island and the Jumbo. This is the Big Burger, uh, okay. double cheese, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise with onion rings. And this is the Quadzilla. Four patties, comes any way you want it. And we're gonna load the quad up with everything. Lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, and raw onion on the side. Uh, the Quadzilla, that, uh, that's been around not since 1948. It's about the last 10 years we just came up with it. Everybody always wanted to add more and more and more. So we came up with the Quadzilla. It's uh, four patties, two pieces of cheese, dressed any way you like. Uh, the world record for quads is guy sat down and ate four quads, a cheese fry and a shake. So that's our unofficial record here and no one's tried to challenge it yet, but it's there if anyone wants to. Our customers are very loyal. We respect our customers. 
and it, it, it kind of shows because of the return business, the repeat business that we get. I mean, we've had people eating here generations. We'll have grandpa bring their son and the grandkid here, and you know, from young age, we have people coming in here, and we see them grow up. We see them get their driver's license, go through high school, college, move away, come back, and it's just, it's part of the people that live around here. We'll see people at the stoplight throw their burger on and have it done before they get here. We've got people like Mr. Polisis down there that drives 40 miles one way, three or four times a week, uh, and he's done it. He's actually here the second day Gordon ever opened. When somebody goes away and they move out, go through college, get a job maybe in any part of the United States, first thing they do when they come back for a holiday, a weekend, or a family function, is they come to us and have a burger. And that's, you know, it happens over and over again. Myself and my parents are here every day to, to greet everyone, talk to everyone, and uh, we're just we're friends with a lot of people that come in here and they, you know, we, it's just great dealing with the people and making the food and making something that people really appreciate. And it's, it's, uh, it's rewarding. Those burgers at Gordon's are unbelievable. I'd say it's in my top two or three that I've ever had. So you need to get down to Crystal City and check those out for sure. Now my coals are white, white hot, and it's time to go ahead and dump this, um, all these coals into the grill. Make sure you protect your hand because it's going to be extremely, extremely hot. And all you do is dump them in, kind of spread those guys around. And then be really careful to put this out of reach of anybody because looking at it, you don't know that it's hot, but it is screaming hot right now. All right, so my fire is nice and hot. These are the chicken thighs that just have a generous amount of salt and pepper and of course the glaze that I just made inside. So I'm gonna put these down on the grill, skin side first, over the hottest part of the grill. We're gonna get these nice and done on one side, and when we flip them over, we're gonna go ahead and baste them with that gorgeous pomegranate and orange juice glaze. All right, so I have brushed this gorgeous glaze on these chicken thighs a couple of times, and it's going, you should probably baste them maybe three or four times while they're on the grill just to make sure all that flavor gets soaked into the chicken. Now what I'm doing outside today is grilling and a lot of times people will use the terms grilling and barbecue interchangeably but this is definitely not barbecue and so let's go meet Mike Mills who is a legend at barbecue. You know, I grew up with barbecue as a young child. I can remember standing in my crib, my dad outside barbecuing. I knew what was going on because I could smell the smoke. You know, I, I feel very fortunate that our family has had a barbecue sauce for over a hundred years. It was always my dad's dream to be able to have a barbecue place and to be able to sell that sauce. After my father passed away, my mother made and sold that sauce one gallon at a time. That helped provide for the five kids that was at home during that period of time. In my own mind, I know that he's, that he's very happy. You know, I kind of fulfilled a dream of his. See, I'm actually a dental technician by trade. I make prosthetic appliances for dentists. And I started in that business in 1962. In 1985, I bought what is now 17th Street. We would barbecue and have chicken fries, fish fries, that type of thing, have parties in the parking lot. But I did that to make the bar business good. And it worked, it worked very well. I actually didn't get into the selling the barbecue until 1994 in order to go into it full time and try to make a living at selling barbecue. The magic about barbecue is kind of, it's, it's kind of complex, but yet it's kind of very simple. And the magic part of it, preparing it and putting it on, this type of thing, is a very simple method. But the magic happens, be a combination between the smoke, the amount of heat, the amount of time, and I'm gonna tell you the dry rubs, which we refer to ours as a magic dust. We cook at a low temperature. My magic numbers are 210 degrees up to 225. I don't cook hot and fast. We're low and slow. And what we'll do is I go down one side and I'm gonna give them a dusting because they will get three coats before it's a finished product. They'll get three coats of this. 
I don't rub it in as they call it a rub. And the heavier you put this on, the crustier it will be. Those are ready. I will go out into the firebox and put some wood on, and then they will start the cooking process. My friend told me about these barbecue contests, and I had never heard of one before. After checking them out and going to visit one, I thought, wow, this is it. And at that time, we thought, let's put a team in it. Make a long story short, in 1990, we were fortunate enough to win the World Grand Championship in Memphis in May. That was in our fifth try at a contest. And then the rest of it's history. We were fortunate enough to win four world champions and three world grand champions. So I've been very fortunate, very lucky, and the barbecue gods have been, they graced me. This happens to be wild cherry. My dad cooked with it, but he would cook it down and make coals out of it. When I take and put this in, I'll gently lay that in there. But you can cook with any wood. Pecan is great, it has a, a nice nutty flavor to it, earthy. All woods work, just how much you want to use of that wood to the flavor profile that works for you. You know, one of the great things about barbecue and the big connection between everyone is it's something that we can identify with. I always say that it's about friends and family and the love thereof. There's no barrier, no ethnic background, no, you know, no religion, no nothing, and it makes no difference what your lot in life is. We're, we're cooking barbecue. So I come in, I'll give them what I call two light coats. See, I went nice and even all the way around there, so that no matter where they happen to bite, they're gonna be able to get the, the full flavor of that rib. But you got full flavor, it's all about flavor. At the same time, you should be able to take this. If you have to use a knife to cut your ribs, I didn't do my job. See this nice pink meat as it's coming through here, how it glistens, that's still the collagen that's in that meat it hasn't been cooked out, cooked to death. What I want is you to be able to bite that off the bone and you see your teeth print. That's when it's perfectly cooked. People ask me all the time, how come barbecuers are always so friendly? First off, they're proud of what they do. They've came up with it and it's their idea. That's what makes all of us be able to be in the barbecue business, but each one of us be a little bit different. I always say if it works, there's no perfect exact way to do it, but whatever works for you, your friends, your family, then that's perfect. And that's the way it ought to be. I don't know if you really took a look at the background when he was being interviewed, but all of those trophies, that's about a third of what he's actually won. The rest are scattered at the restaurants across the country that he owns and he consults with. He's an amazing, amazing guy. And his daughter, Amy, is kind of his right-hand woman, so to speak. She handles PR and also kind of looking ahead in the game for the company. So let's go meet her at 17th Street Barbecue in Murfreesboro, Illinois. My first memories of barbecue are really about family reunions and family gatherings and barbecue sauce. Our family is large. My dad is one of five children. I'm one of 10 first cousins. And my grandmother, the matriarch of our family, Mama Faye, lived until she was 98 and a half years old. So every warm family memory I have involves a barbecue grill or a pit and really delicious barbecue my dad was cooking. After living in Dallas and working in advertising there, I would come home and my dad would ask me, you know, to make me a form for this or I need a little ad that, about that. But I got really involved when I came home and he handed me this little piece of paper and he said, can you call this woman back for me? And I did and it was a reporter from Martha Stewart Living Magazine and she said, oh, I was writing an article about mail order barbecue but I called three weeks ago and I've already written the article. So I said, Daddy, you just missed this opportunity. Give me those little pieces of paper and I'll start following up for you. And so, you know, very slowly, I kind of crept back into the business. And I realized that these, this is like this very special slice of Americana that needed to be captured. I really came back in full force with the book, Peace, Love, and Barbecue. You know, I wrote the book in his words. And that book has really sort of become a seminal barbecue book. The recipes are good, but the stories really draw you in. And they're stories that you haven't heard before because nobody ever thought to ask those questions or nobody knew the little backstory. So that was incredibly special. 
Working with my dad has really been a huge blessing. We've always been close. We had a period of time when I lived away. We really have come full circle. I can sort of channel him. I know what he's going to say. So it's, it's really been great. My dad is extremely old school. He does not have a computer. And I'm very forward thinking, and I think the balance of that has really has taken us a lot of places. People who come to us now for advice, and that's sort of one of the new directions I've taken our company. I've started this consulting arm called On Cue. People come from all over the world wanting to sit at the feet of the master and learn about barbecue. So over the past five years, we've had people from 45 states and 15 countries come to learn about barbecue, and we've helped incubate dozens of barbecue restaurants, and they want to know how can we make our barbecue better or make our business practices better. And there are a lot of people who just want to see behind the Iron Curtain at 17th Street. So it's really been an interesting ride and an interesting group of people. Another thing that's in the works that's very exciting is a building we bought around the corner, and it is going to be the factory at 17th Street. We are going to bottle our sauces there and our dry rub. I'm hoping that that will employ a few more people and again bring some more economic relief to our town. You know, as many improvements as I might want to make or things that I want to do, I'm always thinking, you know, is that 17th Street? You know, this is my life. It's my family's heritage, history. It's our culture. It's, this is the Mills family. I love meeting Amy. She is a total ball of energy. And it's exciting that they are trying to bring some economic development to Murfreesboro. And as soon as they open up that barbecue manufacturing plant, you know I'm going to take an afternoon and visit. So I am just drizzling this pomegranate molasses vinaigrette on top of our gorgeous summer salad. And you might be wondering why I am pairing a red wine with a grilled chicken dish and a salad, and it is because of that pomegranate molasses. This wonderful medium-bodied red wine is going to play very, very nicely off that sweet tart quality of our mystery ingredient. And this wine, by the way, is a red blend that's produced by St. James Winery, uh, pretty close to the center of the state, and they're producing it in conjunction with the Missouri State Parks Foundation. And if you notice, it's named after Johnson shut-ins. So it's a perfect ode to summer, and I'll see you next month. <laughs>